How we doing today? For the, the 20th time, happy new year. Glad to be here, glad it's a new year. Um, glad to see all your faces. So congratulations, you made it to 2023. Uh, this is my favorite week of the year because so far this year I can say with confidence that I have read my Bible every single day. I've spent a good amount of time in, in prayer every single day this year. I've exercised every day this year. And uh, that might be the only time, the only week that I can say that for the rest of the year. But so far this year, I have been perfect. So I really, really do like uh, the first week of the year. So um, if I haven't had a chance to meet you, my name's Jake Johnson. I'm the pastor here. And we're just so glad that you're joining us. If you're online, I wanna say welcome. We're glad that you're visiting and, and checking us out. And we'd love to see you come out in person because we really believe that when we get together, we get more familiar with each other, there's more life exchange and there's more life change. And so we hope to be able to see you in person uh, one of these weeks. And, and we're actually gonna talk during this series about someone who spent a ton of personal time with our Lord and Savior Jesus. In fact, he probably spent more face time with Jesus than any other person. Because if, I don't know if there are bunk beds in Bible times. I haven't looked in the cultural you know, records to see if that's kinda how they did things. But if there were bunk beds, the only book that we would have from someone who might have shared a bunk bed with Jesus would be the book of James that we're gonna go through. And that's because James was Jesus' brother. How many of you knew that? You guys know that? James was actually Jesus' brother. So he was his half-brother, not his full brother, because we know Jesus was, was conceived by God and Mary birthed him, and, and then Mary had a husband, Joseph, and Jesus had other brothers and sisters after that, but Jesus was kind of the first, so he was the big brother. And, you know, James grew up, that had to be a weird kind of a household to grow up in. Think about it, growing up in a household with big brother Jesus you know, like we all wear the little wristbands, what would Jesus do, or at least people used to, maybe like 10 years ago, I'm probably dating, you know, culture a little bit. But James probably had to hear that before anybody else. Like, what would Jesus do? You know, and he probably had his mom told him, why can't you just be more like Jesus? Why can't you just be more like your brother? He had to deal with those kinds of things, you know, the, the sibling rivalries. And in fact, James wasn't always a follower of Jesus. James didn't grow up thinking, oh, this is the son of God I'm living with. In fact, it wasn't until after Jesus' death and resurrection that James became a, a fully-fledged follower of Jesus and considered himself a servant. So we're gonna dig more into the context of James and kind of maybe how he looked at the world a little bit differently than how we might look at the world. And, and it's, this is my favorite book of the Bible. Um, I love it. It's a great merger of practical knowledge, but some really powerful spiritual truths as well. In fact, James is called uh, the boldest book in the Bible because he is just in your face, and, and I love it. Uh, I love the way that he talks to us. In fact, it's, it's called the Proverbs of the New Testament. So let's dig into it. If, if you're taking notes today, if you were to title today's message, I would title it The Cheat Sheet for Tests. So I'm gonna read through the first 18 verses, and then we're gonna go back through verse by verse, and we're gonna talk about how James teaches us different things about tests. So let's start, James chapter one, verse one. He says this, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith without doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that's driven and tossed by the wind. That person must not suppose that he'll receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exultation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he'll pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he stood the test, he'll receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. And let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. 
But each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. Don't be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Mm, so good. Let's dig in to what James is saying here. So let's go back to the first verse and talk about the context. He starts off, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, so he accepts his brother as the Lord and Savior right now, and God, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion or the diaspora, greetings. So this is a time where the Hebrew people and, and believers are spread all over. They, they've suffered lots and lots of trials. They've suffered lots and lots of persecution, and they're, they're not all together in Jerusalem. So James is writing this letter to help bring some clarity, some consistency to both beliefs and behaviors. So he wants all of them to read this letter and kind of get on the same page. And like I said, we're gonna talk about testing, we're gonna talk about testing of our faith specifically, and James is gonna get into it. But before we go there, I wanna see what Proverbs says about testing. It says this, the crucible is for silver, the furnace is for gold, and the Lord tests hearts. God tests hearts. And if tests do anything, they reveal. Tests, tests aren't necessarily meant to, to just make things stink for us. They're meant to expose things. They're meant to expose if we're ready to move on to the next level. So when you take tests in class, they're there to see if you're ready to graduate. Are you ready to go from second grade to third grade? Are you ready to go from you know, high school to the next level of undergraduate school? Are you ready to go from just sitting in an OR watching a doctor do operation to doing operations yourself? Are you ready to go from sitting next to mom and dad in the car to driving the car? Tests reveal where you're at and they help the person who's administrating the test know, can I pass this person on? Can I move them to the next stage? Don't we, don't we all wanna move on? Don't we, all, we all wanna upgrade, right? We, we don't wanna stay stuck in the same spot. None of us wanna be third graders forever. I don't wanna do that. I wanna move on. I wanna move to new levels in Christ. I wanna move to new levels in my faith. And that's what tests do. And so there are two ways we get tested that James is gonna take us through today. The first way is trials. Trials are tests that we have to face. This is what it says. Verse two, he says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. What in the world? Second verse in James, and it's like, I'm, you already lost me, man. Count it all joy when you fall into trials. What is that about? But here's the thing. This perspective is a paradigm shift, and it makes this chapter so important. It makes it so important to, to the rest of this book, but also our lives. So the first thing that you need to do when you find yourself in a trial is this. You need to recognize what's really going on. Recognize what's really happening when you're in a trial because there's more going on than what you see and what you feel and what you experience. And some of you are in trials right now and you need to hear this. So, so tune in to what James teaches us about trials. He says, count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds for or because you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. That's, that's perseverance. It's patient endurance. So think about it this way. You're not just in a traffic jam an opportunity to grow in patience. You're, you're not just dealing with annoying neighbors or coworkers, it's an opportunity to have compassion. It's not just identity theft, it's an opportunity to change your password. Like, there are opportunities. When you're facing trials, there are opportunities, there are tests to see if you're ready to move on. And you know this is true. Most of the time, the annoyance that we're facing actually hijacks the learning experience and we miss the opportunity to pass the test because we're so focused on the annoyance that we forget what's going on. We don't realize what's going on. So don't let those things hijack what God is trying to teach you because you wanna pass the test. You don't wanna get caught up in the frustration. You wanna pass the test and move on. And when James says count it joy, he's not actually saying that the situation you're in doesn't stink. Like that's, that's not what he means. So if I, could, if I could break that down for you, this is this counting it joy. Here's what I think it would mean. So New Year's, everybody's making resolutions. So probably go to the gym more. The gyms are packed with people. How many have a fitness goal for, for the New Year? Nobody? Come on. Okay, we got some people. We have fitness goals for the New Year. Okay, 
So I'm gonna make this statement, and you're probably gonna disagree with me initially, some of you, but just follow, follow me for a minute. I don't think anybody actually enjoys working out, okay? I don't think you enjoy working out. And what I mean is, I don't think if I could take the sensation of working out, the sensation of actually pushing weight without actually being in a gym and doing it, and just put that sensation in your muscles, or the sensation of being on a treadmill and being out of breath, and being you know, exhausted and having muscle pain in your legs, or the sensation of being lightheaded because you, you, you did too much work, or just sweating and being all sticky and yucky. I don't think any of those sensations in and of themselves are enjoyable. We, could we agree with that? We can agree with that, right? But see, what's happening is when you're working out, you can smile because what you're doing is you're counting it joy because you know that, man, I'm running 10 minute miles right now, but I bet in a week or a month, I'll be able to run nine minute miles. Mm, I bet my body's gonna be healthier. I bet I'm actually gonna get stronger. You, you're, when you're pushing those weights up, what you're doing in effect is you are pre-enjoying the fruit of the trial that you're in. You're seeing like, man, I, I'm gonna get better as a result of this. That's what James is saying here. That's why you can reckon trials as joyful, not because it's actually enjoyable to be in the midst of it, but because you think, if you think in the middle of it, you know what, God's doing something in me. I don't know what it is. I don't know how big I'm gonna get after this. I'm gonna get swollen though, I know. Like man, I'm gonna be tough when this is done. That's what James is saying. Reckon it joy, count it joy when you're in trials of various kinds because God, the tester, God is giving you an opportunity to move into something new. Don't miss it, don't let annoyances hijack it. So we need to recognize what's going on. And number two, we need to cooperate with the growth process. You can't fight against the weights, you can't fight against a treadmill. Cooperate with what's going on. And how do I know that they're part of God's growth process? Well, James tells me, verse four, he says, let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect. He means mature, that you may grow into perfection. Everything that God has for you, everything he's planned for you to be, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Some of you have been praying like, man, God, I want new things for, for, for me this year. God, I wanna grow. I want everything that you have for me, Lord. Everything. We want that, don't we? And then God puts us in an opportunity to be able to receive that, and we wanna jump right out. Well, here's the deal. How do you think God was gonna answer your prayer of growth? How does he produce steadfastness? How does he produce maturity in you? It's through trials. That's actually how you get refined, that's how you get purified. It doesn't just happen. You don't just wake up one day and say, you know, I wanna have really big muscles. You gotta go to the gym, you gotta, you gotta put your muscles through some trials if you want them to get bigger. And that's what God is doing in and through us in our character, he's developing us. So when, when you can't fight against the process, we do that a lot of times because tests reveal where we're at and we just wanna jump right out of the test that he's got us in and then we have to repeat it in the future. God wants you to move forward. Hear me, God wants you to move forward. He wants you to graduate because the deal is God is more concerned with your character than he is with your comfort. He's more concerned with that. He wants your holiness more than he wants your happiness. That's more important, and that's what we, that's what we should want as well. And you do the same thing with your kids, don't you? My kids do not like getting up in the morning, a couple of them. A couple of them just like beep, pop out of bed. Some of them don't like getting up in the morning. But you know what? I, I make them go through that trial so that way they can go to school and they can mature. It stinks when they're rude to people. Guess what, I challenge them in that trial and I make them be polite. We make them eat green stuff even though they don't want to. We do all those things because we wanna produce something in them. We're more concerned with what's being developed than we are with their happiness in the moment. So when we're in the middle of the trial though, a lot of times we wanna know what to do. Like okay, so how do I navigate this? Again, James got the answer. Here's what he says. Verse number five, you gotta ask for God's help. So you need to recognize what's going on, don't fight against the growth process, and then ask God for help. And, and here's what it says, verse five, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, 
and it'll be given to him. A lot of the verses in James, you can pull these out and you can preach them all by themselves. They're just, they're like, like I said, it's like the Proverbs of the New Testament. They're great passages to edify us and grow us. But in the context of trials, this makes so much sense. That that's what we should be doing. We should be asking God. And here's what's cool about it. God doesn't put conditions on the request. He, he doesn't say, well listen, you've kind of been a jerk, so I'm not gonna give you wisdom. But you know what, you actually, you, you, I, I just really, we haven't been close, I'm not gonna give you an answer. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, or another way to translate it is without finding fault. God's not gonna do like Santa and check the naughty nice list and see which one you're on before he gives you the answer. He's gonna give you wisdom. He's gonna give it to you because God wants you to graduate. He wants you to move through the trial and get to a next level because he's got some good things for you and he has good things for you this year. So some of you are in a trial. You're recognizing it now. You need to ask God. But see, when you ask God, mm, this is the hard part. He does sort of put a condition on the end of it. When you ask God, you gotta ask him with faith. Verse six, he says, but... Let him ask in faith without doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. That person must not suppose he'll receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So number four, after you ask God what you're supposed to do, it makes sense, but it's probably the hardest step of all these. You actually have to do it. When God gives you the answer to what, you, to what the, the resolution to your trial, you gotta take action. You gotta put feet to what it is he's told you to do. Many of, many of us, I, and I, I fall victim to this as well, I ask God, Lord, what should I do? He gives me an answer immediately. It's like, what's the wise thing to do? Well, I should do this. Yeah, but I don't wanna do that. <laughs> I want a different answer. That's what we do, isn't it? We want God to give us a different answer. So if, think about this. When he says ask in faith, just unpack that word. If I were to go to someone who knows how to work on a car, they, they know things about cars. In fact, my buddy Brad, uh, if I have car problems, I call him. If I were to go to Brad, and I knew Brad was an expert, let's say, on my Chevy Silverado, and I, I go to him and I say, what should I do? My car's making this clicking sound. And he says, the problem is this. You, you know, you need a new ignition coil. And I, I say, you know, I think I'm gonna go try something else. Is that a faith-filled response? No, but if I ask him and I have faith in what he's saying, I'm just gonna do it. Even if I don't understand how an engine works, I'm gonna do what he says because I have faith in the person who gave me the answer. God has all the answers for your trials, every single one of them, and it says he's gonna give you the answer on how to navigate it. You just gotta ask him, and he's not gonna, he's not gonna check if you're good or bad before he gives you the answer, but if you don't respond to him, you shouldn't expect to receive anything from him. Because he's like, you don't listen. You're not listening to me. You just get driven left and right like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed with the wind, wherever the wind blows, whatever your whims are, that's what you're gonna do. But what we should do is do what God says. Mm. I think people a lot of times think money can fix all their problems. And money can fix a lot of problems at least temporarily. Um, and it's almost like people with money think that they don't need God because they don't have to ask him for guidance. Like, I can just pay this problem away. No, you can just delay it for a little bit, but you're not gonna pass the test. James goes on, verse nine. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation or his humbling because like a flower of the grass, he'll pass away. For the sun rises with a scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. That's what rich people are like. It's just a little while here and then it's gone. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. See, it's kind of good sometimes when, when you're wealthy, you've got everything going for you and you get humbled just a little bit because it helps you realize you need God. You need, you need him. Money can't fix all the problems. That's one of the things James is trying to teach us here. So, so we counted all joy. We recognize what God, what's going on, we cooperate with God's growth process, we ask him for help, and then we do what he's told us to do and look at the results that come from it. James 1, 12, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial because when he stood the test, 
He'll receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. That's awesome. God has a crown he wants to give you. He wants you to remain steadfast. He wants you to endure. He wants you to continue, and he's gonna give you a reward. If, if I could say it this way, maybe just a different way to restate what James is saying here, is if you don't quit, you win. If you don't quit, you win. Just don't quit. Keep going. Keep pushing through the trial. So I said there's two ways our faith gets tested. The first is trials. The second one is this. The second one is temptation. And this is a hard one. This is the one I felt like as I, as I prayed for us that God really wanted to pull some things out and, and, and show us. It was temptations. Maybe, maybe there's, you know, a lot of temptation that's happening right now in some of your lives and the Holy Spirit just wants to speak to you. So let, let's tune in and let's just see some of the things that James says about temptation. So um, any of you guys ever been to Bass Pro Shop? Yep, Bass Pro Shop's pretty cool. It's like Disneyland for rednecks. It's awesome. And so you, you go to Bass Pro Shop and they've got this big glass that has all these fish that you can just kind of stare at as they're swimming around. And so one of the things that they do sometimes is they'll test out new lures. And you can actually watch as the fish go and chase this, this bait, the different types of bait. And you can see what happens. They're getting tempted by the bait. And that's what temptation does to us. It serves one purpose, to draw us away from God. That's what temptations do. And James has a solution for that. James, James, has, James has some illumination he wants to give us around the issue of temptation. So when it comes to temptations, here's the first thing you need to do. You need to recognize the source of the temptations. Because oftentimes, we place the blame where it doesn't belong. James tells us the source, verse 13, let no one say when he's tempted. He just immediately, so bold, so direct, in your face. Don't any of you say when you're tempted, oh, I'm being tempted by God. No, because God can't be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. God's not the one who's tempting you, okay? So you might think, well, you know what? It's because the devil's tempting me. Mm -mm. He actually doesn't say that either, which is kind of crazy. Now the devil does tempt us, but that's not, that's not always the source of temptation. And that's what James is trying to, to, to pull out. And we're gonna talk through the process. So that's number two. Understand the process of temptation. James 1, 14, he says, but each person is tempted when he is lured away and enticed by what? His own desire. Mm. So there's something in you that's leading to this temptation. You've got something in you that's causing you to be tempted. You're being lured away from God's plans for your life. You're being lured into something that the enemy has for you. The enemy would love nothing more than for you to give in to all your fleshly desires. And this is what it says, then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. That's the plan of the enemy for your life. He wants death for you. It's always a plan of the enemy. He's always gunning for your death. Your death in relationships, he wants death in your finances, he wants death in your body, he wants death in all those areas to make a mockery of God. That's what, he's, that's what he's gunning for. And that's what sin does in our life is it always leads to death, every single time. So I'm just gonna, let's just go through this real quick, just this process, because some of you are maybe on step one, some of you may be on step five, but this sin is a progression. It doesn't just happen. Nobody wakes up and says, you know, I think I'm gonna cheat on my wife today. It doesn't happen. You know, I think I'm gonna uh, be really greedy today. I think I'm gonna go steal some money. You know, I think I'm gonna be angry today. That's a really good thing for me to do today. Let's just have an angry day. That's not how it works. None of us start off motivated and excited to walk into sin. It's a progression. It's a slow burn oftentimes. So this is what happens. First, there's the temptation, and they come. They come all the time. In fact, Jesus said, temptations are necessary. They're gonna come. Woe to him by whom they come, but, but they're, they're gonna come. They happen. So think about it this way. You ever heard the saying, you, you can't stop a bird from flying by your head, but you can stop it from making a nest in your hair? That's how temptations are. They're gonna happen. You can't stop them. They're all around all the time. Temptation here, temptation there. Always gonna happen. You can't avoid it. But what happens, though, is when the temptation starts, then lust, the desire starts to pull you away. So you see the bird, oh, 
there's a little desire in me. Oh, I see somebody's house is bigger than mine. Somebody's got a nicer car than mine. And greed. And then I start to fantasize about it. I think, man, what would it be like if I had that car? No, no. Fan- oh, man, what would it be like if I had that house? No, no. Or, hey, worse yet, guys. Girls, too, but probably guys more than girls. Mm. Oh, wow, she's really attractive. Mm, no, I'm not going to do that. Oh, but man, what would it be like? What would it be like to date her? Mm. And then you go a little bit further down the rabbit hole, and a little further, and a little further, and the fantasy grows. You're moving towards sin. It's that progression. Your eyes lead you, your feet follow, and you begin to, to get closer and closer and closer to the act of sin. See, what we're supposed to do when we have youthful lusts, what does the Bible say? Flee! <laughs> We're supposed to go the other way. When, when lust starts to pull us, when desire starts to pull us this way, the Bible teaches you're supposed to turn your feet and run the other way. That's what we're supposed to do. But what we often do is we just want to, like, I just want to get as close as I can to the sin. Come on, you know you do this. As close as I can without actually crossing the line. Like, I know I've got these boundaries in my life, but if I do this, like, I mean, just, let's just get close. Just like a little, little taste. That's what we do. We fantasize about it instead of moving the other way. And then we have the act of sin. When that lust gets conceived, it gives birth to sin. And there's really only one thing that you can do when you sin. Because the result is gonna be death. If you, if you sin and you're, you're greedy, that, that covetousness, it's gonna eat away at relationships with your friends, with your family. It's gonna destroy that. There, there will be little deaths that you experience. Jealousy, little deaths, I promise you. Anger, little deaths all along the way. And all those sins actually result in an eternal death as well. It's gonna kill you in the end. That's the devil's plan. He wants to destroy everything good that you have in your life. And if he's not gonna destroy it, he wants to just keep you from it as long as he possibly can. But see, when we sin, the great thing about it is that we can come to God and we can repent. Before it leads to that final death, we can turn to Jesus, we can confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, and then he's gonna lead us into eternal life. That's God's plan. But see, I I really don't want any of you to actually get there. I really, how many of you would like to overcome temptation before it turns into death? Yes, yes, can we do that? Let's, let's, let's look and see what James says about this. So verse 16, he says, don't be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there's no variation or shadow due to change. God is good, God is on your side. He's always gonna give you good things. He's not gonna give you the bad things, he's gonna give you the good things. And when I say God can't be tempted by evil, when James says that, what we don't mean, we're not saying that, that the birds don't fly around God. What we're saying is they're not gonna alight on him. Like it's just an ineffective sort of a thing to God. God can't be effectively tempted by evil. That, that doesn't work because we know that Jesus was God, true? Was Jesus tempted? Yes, Jesus was tempted. Whoa. Jesus was tempted. He was absolutely tempted. Let, let's look and see how Jesus was tempted. Luke chapter four, verses one through 13. It says this, and Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by the devil. It's a long temptation. (coughs) He ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you're the son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered and said, it's written, man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And he said to him, to you I will give all this authority and their glory for it's been delivered to me. How many of you know that this world belonged to Satan? It was delivered to him. Adam and Eve, when they failed, they delivered this this world to Satan. So he's just stating a fact. This world's mine. I'll give it though to whom I will, he says. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus said, it's written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. So Satan took him up to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of a temple and he said to him, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it's written, he'll command his angels concerning you to guard you 
and on their hands they'll bear you up lest you strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered and said, answered him, it is said you shall not put your Lord, the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. See, the devil can try to tempt God, but it actually won't work. And for us, when we are feeling temptation, what we often forget is that the same spirit that was in Christ is in us as believers. We can overcome temptation because he lives inside us. If you're a believer, you actually don't have to sin forever. You don't have to keep on sinning over and over and over and over again. Jesus came to set us free from the bondage of sin. We don't have to live there. Somebody say, yeah, seriously, somebody say amen because that's good news, guys. That is the gospel, the good news that Jesus came to set us free and liberate us. I don't wanna have to live in sin anymore. I don't want that, and I don't want that for you guys either. I want this year to be your best year yet. And part of that is gonna, gonna be dealing with the temptations that you face and overcoming those. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says this, no temptation has taken you that is not common to man, but God is faithful and he won't let you be tempted beyond your ability, but will, with the temptation, provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Again, let me just say it. God wants you to pass the test. He wants you to pass the test. He wants you to graduate. You know, if, as I look back at, at Luke chapter four, I, I think it's pretty interesting because the thing is like, negative motivation only goes so far. Like the do nots only go so far um, at some point, we gotta push into positive reasons to not sin or positive reasons to not do something. Um, Jesus had three temptations that we read about in the desert, right? So maybe not throwing yourself off a building is something that is just not a temptation for you. Now, there may be some people in here who harming yourself is a legitimate temptation, so I'm not making light of that. But, but that's probably not the predominant temptation. But I'll tell you this, what about questioning God's goodness? What about questioning his faithfulness? What about questioning his favor? That's what, that's what Satan was really telling Jesus to do there. Will he really catch you? Why don't you just test him, just see. Just see if God's actually as good as he says. That's the same thing he told Eve and Adam to do. And worshiping Satan, actually bowing down and giving him glory that's due to God, probably is not gonna be a temptation for anybody in this room. I, I, I can almost guarantee that. But here's the deal. I think there was more to that temptation. How many of you are tempted to take shortcuts? Think about the shortcut that Satan offered Jesus here. You don't have to suffer. Hmm? You don't have to go through all this. You don't have to gather all these people. You don't have to do any of it. I'll just give it, I'll just, I'll just give you the whole world. Here you go. It's been given to me. I'll turn it back over to you. You just gotta take a shortcut. Listen, I'll let you graduate. I'll give you a diploma right now. You don't have to go through any of the tests. You don't have to go through any of the maturing. You don't have to go through any of the trials. Just move, move on, pass, go, all of it. You're, you're good. Anybody tempted? Tax season's coming up. Anybody tempted to take shortcuts on your taxes? Mmm. Yeah, you know it. Here's the thing, Jesus knew there's no real shortcuts. You can't shortcut a workout. You can't shortcut that. But I'll tell you, the, the one thing that I really want you guys to get, the one thing that hit me the most when I was looking through this was the temptation of bread. And the reason is because in, in this circumstance, like let's just agree, eating bread is not a bad thing, is it? Is eating bread bad? No, it's not bad. It's not bad to eat bread. Jesus was hungry. 40 days he hadn't had anything to eat. He's pretty hungry. Is it bad to eat something when you're hungry? No, it's not a bad idea. It's not wrong, it's not, not sinful. Here's the deal. That wasn't what God had in store for him. Some of us, God has really good things. Like there, there, are, there are reasons to not do things because they're wrong and evil. There are also reasons to not do things because God has something better for us on the other side of our waiting, on the other side of our patience, amen? And some of, some of us in here have good things that God has planned for you in 2023, and the enemy's saying, hey, look, just, one, just tap out. 
It's not wrong. It's not evil. Just tap out. Just eat some bread. Come on. You, you, you've suffered long enough. You, it's, it's been hard enough for you. Like, let's just move on into the next thing. But Jesus, thank God for you, Jesus. Jesus didn't tap out. He kept going. He kept going through the temptation. And because of that, you and I can have liberty. I'm gonna tell you, God has some amazing, amazing, amazing things for you. Do not let the devil rob you of the good that God has for you this year. Don't do that. Don't take shortcuts. Don't let him steal it. Verse 18. He wants good things for us because you're one of his kids. It says of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. He created you. He loves you. He wants you to draw near to him. And the closer you get to him, the less that you're gonna want sin in your life. As you draw near to him, sin is gonna be something that you just wanna stay as far away from as possible. It becomes less and less enticing, less and less of an anchor for us. Let's see, if we wanna overcome it, we're gonna talk more next week about how we overcome temptation. But I'm just gonna give you a couple quick things today. If we wanna overcome temptation, we're actually helping you this year. Right as we start off the year, we're we're gonna give you some practical ways to do that. I'll tell you, one of the ways I overcome temptation is I get myself around other believers. I pursue Jesus with people. I come here to church, but I also have small groups. I have multiple small groups that I'm a part of. And I have guys that I get with. We talk about temptation. We talk about sin. We talk about our eyes and our feet. We talk about our heart, like where it is. Are we we being greedy? Are we being prideful? Are we being lustful? Are we being angry? All those things. We, We discuss those things. And for you, this new year, we're having small group Sunday next week. I would encourage you, if you are struggling with temptation, get with some people. Because if you don't, you know what? You're gonna keep getting beat up. Like, you you won't win. And I want you to win. God wants you to win. So get with his people. The other thing is, again, as we draw close to Jesus, be in his word, pursue him. We're starting 21 days of prayer and fasting today. So some of you may not be on our email list. If you're not, this may be the first time you heard it. That's okay. If you wanna get on our email or text distro, go out to the Connection Center and and put your information out there. But we're gonna start leaning into God this year. When I I read this passage in in, in Luke, I I used to always read it and think, Jesus went out into the desert to um, fast to weaken himself. So that way it was like, That way he was more susceptible to the temptations of the enemy. I don't think that's actually what was happening. I don't think Jesus was trying to to make himself vulnerable so he felt more like us. I think Jesus was powering up. I think he was getting ready. And that's what fasting and prayer does for us. If you want an upgrade in 2023, and there's no better way to start than by fasting and praying and being in relationship with other people. I'm gonna do that, and I'm gonna tell you, I I am chasing Jesus this year. What I want for us is I want God's spirit, I want God's presence to be here in such a full way that when people walk in the door, they're overwhelmed by his goodness. I want people's lives to be so much better. I want relationships to be restored. I want goodness to overflow out of us into this community, all of those good things. And I'm gonna tell you, whatever it takes, I'm not gonna let go of that dream. I'm not gonna let go of that hope. And I'm gonna chase down Jesus this year. At the beginning of the year, I'm gonna fast, I'm gonna deny my flesh and power up my spirit and focus on what God's doing in me. I just wanna be near him. And so I would encourage you this year, join us in 21 days of prayer and fasting. Pick something, and fasting, you know, you may not know what fasting is, I'd love to sit down and talk with you about it more, but fasting at its core is this, not eating. Like you can fast from TV, you can fast from social media, those are good things to fast from as well. But really, at, at in its truest form, fasting is, is denying your body food. And, and so, it's a good thing to do. Maybe it's a meal a day. You decide, like, I'm gonna skip that meal and I'm gonna pray. Maybe it's a whole day. Maybe you're gonna do a complete fast. That's okay. Maybe you're gonna do it for multiple days. That's okay too. But I would encourage you, spend, spend some time this afternoon asking God what he would have you do. Only do what, ask him for wisdom. We just talked about that today, right? God, what is it you want for me this year? 
Give me some wisdom about how I should fast and how I should press into your spirit. Amen? Let's bow our heads. Actually, could we stand up? Can we stand up? I wanna pray for us and then we're gonna close with this song here as we worship together. Lord, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you that you grew up in a family, Jesus. How cool is that? You grew up with brothers. And we get to hear from one of your brothers who, who lived with you. And so, God, we thank you for your word. Lord, I, I, I know that many people in the sound of my voice right now are experiencing trials. They're experiencing temptations. And God, I pray that you would give them vision to understand what's really happening, God. That they would see where the temptation's coming from. That they would see that their trials are probably more than, than just annoyances, God. And Lord, may we do well this year. May we graduate, God. I pray for divine favor. I pray, Lord, just for your, your spirit to empower us to fight against the temptation, Lord, and to, to reckon ourselves dead to sin, to count it joy when we're facing trials, God. Help us do that, Lord. And God, I pray, Lord, just for your blessings over this church and over these people in 2023. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen.